and welcome to the Scotta Chronicast, the podcast which discusses all things relating to medieval Scotland. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Buchanan. This is episode 18, and I am excited to welcome back Dr. Lucy Dean and Dr. Katie Jack, who are going to be your guest hosts today. They will be interviewing me, your usual host, Dr. Kate Buchanan. In this episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about my journey to studying medieval Scotland and my route to graduate school. And we'll be talking about castles in Scotland, what their internal spaces say about social interactions, and what the landscape says about a noble's relationship with its community. A brief note, we've had some technical difficulties with the sound quality in some of this recording. Please bear with us for this episode. Without further ado, let's move to the interview. Welcome to the Scotty Chronicast, episode 18. Today we will be interviewing your host, Kate Buchanan. I'm Dr. Lucy Dean from the University of the Highlands and Islands, and my co-host today is Dr. Katie Jack. Would you like to introduce yourself, co-host? Hello. Yes, I am Dr. Katie Jack, here with Dr. Lucy Dean, interviewing Dr. Kate Buchanan. And over to you, Kate, would you like to introduce yourself to your listeners? I am Dr. Kate Buchanan. I do teach occasionally at Southern New Hampshire University in the master's program um, for history there. And my day job is working at a law firm. Okay, brilliant. How did you get into studying medieval Scotland, Kate? Oh, it's a million dollar question. It is, it is. No, I've been thinking about it a lot <laughs> in run up to, oh, I have to answer that question now. <laughs> And what actually like drew me to medieval history, because um, I was very interested in history in general throughout like childhood and particularly costumes. I was always super intrigued by costumes and um, sort of living history museums that we would go to. I think, I mean, there's a lot of things that played into my draw to medieval history, but I'm pretty sure... The main culprit is going to be Brother Cadfile. Oh, I've got to love Brother Cadfile. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just adored both the TV show and the books. I can't, I think I saw the TV show first, but then I just like read all the books that I could find and they were amazing and I still love them. And I still love the TV show. You can go on a tour around the Abbey and have a, like the Brother Cadfile version of the tour as well. <laughs> oh, excellent. Yeah, I think the one one time I've actually been to Shrewsbury, it wasn't open. Oh, that's always oh. such a pain. <laughs> that's so typical. I know. It's like, this is the story of my life. The one time we went to this place, oh, it wasn't open. <laughs> Or it was covered in scaffolding, so I couldn't see what it was that I was there to see. <laughs> yeah, oh, so often. Yeah. So that really sparked my interest in generally the medieval um, era. And I'm surprised it hasn't come up on the show um, yet. So I, I figured I, I really needed to give um, Ellis Peters a shout out there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but then I, I didn't go to university thinking I was going to be a historian. I went to university um, studying, well, with the intention of studying mass communications, mass media, Ooh. and uh, religious studies. So I was going to be like a journalist or something. And uh, like after the first term, first semester, I was like, nope, not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> And then I don't know where I went. I think I was like, oh, I'm going to do psychology instead. And then that didn't really work out. And it was a while before I settled on history. And it's kind of funny because I was always a straight A student. Um, and I got to university and I did take a history class that first semester. I took World History 101 as per you know, most of the student body population in the United States. Um, <laughs> but it was the only class I had gotten a B in, like my 
uh, since I was like a, oh. a high school student. Like it was the only class I got a B. I struggled so much even to get that B because it was just, it was challenging for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that is really what drew me to it. I was like, oh, this is actually a challenge. I love it. Um, and I decided to pursue a history degree and that the instructor, um, Dr. Dr. Susan Taylor, and she was an excellent instructor and I and she was a medievalist so I was just I I want to be you I want to do what you do um Mm -hmm. it's magical that you can read this mysterious handwriting and I want to be able to read that mysterious handwriting too (laughs) and (laughs) and yeah and she was amazing she I guess could see that I really wanted to pursue this, you know, through graduate school and took me under her wing to really prepare me for graduate school in a way that um, was above and beyond what she had to do. And I owe so much to her. Like, she was amazing. And one of the things that she did was take me to conferences. Oh, fab. So she took me to Kalamazoo, drove from... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a ridiculously long way from um, what was just outside Kansas City up to Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, it was a great road trip. It was awesome. <laughs> we did it several times. Um, <laughs> but the first time we talked a lot about like grad school and like what you need to do to get to grad school and that sort of thing. And she was a big fan of, you know, you need to find a supervisor who is going to really work well with you and is going to support you. And we need to go supervisor shopping, essentially. Um, (laughs) I really like the idea of supervisor shopping. (laughs) Yeah. So that was my goal, like, for the first Kalamazoo. <laughs> she was like, all right, here, you've got the, the catalog. We're going supervisor shopping for you. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, I was, yes, interested in medieval Scotland, but I was more interested in, like, Viking history at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I had decided to go to most of, the, like, the Viking sessions. But there was this session on castles. That was a night session. I think it was like a one that was on at like seven. Mm -hmm. And I I didn't make the whole session, I will tell you, because we went to dinner and then we came back to campus and it was still pretty early. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm going to wander over there and see if that session is still going on, because that sounds interesting. Medieval Castle Mm -hmm. sounds interesting enough, right? (laughs) Always. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and so I snuck in to the back of the like last 20 minutes of this the session and it was uh Professor Richard Oram talking about Scottish castles and I was just like whoa <laughs> this is amazing oh wow you can study castles <laughs> I was just absolutely blown away. (laughs) And I was super brave. And I wandered up to him afterwards and asked him some questions. And he was super nice and just talked to me. And there was no sort of like, oh, you're a student? Um, (laughs) Because I was like, still a year away from finishing undergrad at that point. Like I was, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just in the middle of the undergraduate studies. And yeah, and he just had a great conversation with me. And I was like, oh. Wow, there was no like looking down at me for being a like undergrad student at that point or any of that and answered my questions and yeah, we just had a good chat. Nice way to meet your supervisor. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't initially think I was like, oh, this is my supervisor. This is what I'm going to do for my studies. I was just kind of mm-hmm. like, well, that was cool. Um and then carried on, you know, attending all the Viking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it's just a blip. <laughs> that was nice. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, nobody else that I talked to was um as nice to me or like chatted as as freely. Freely. Like, yeah. T- t- yeah, took my questions as seriously or whatever. Um so yeah. that was that was pretty cool. And then yeah, it also turns out that Professor Richard Orham was also interested in Viking history, so I kept like seeing him at all the other sessions. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not stalking you, I promise. (laughs) (laughs) And then um, when it came down to actually making a decision about what I wanted to do, I 
it's like, well, I want to study castles. I want to study Scottish castles now. Um, and I talked to Richard about it and he suggested, oh yeah, well you should, you know, you could come study with me at Stirling or you could, you know, go to Glasgow and, or you could go to Exeter. And he was very good about, you know, just giving me general advice about mm -hmm. where to go mm -hmm. um, for what I wanted to do. And yeah, I, I think I applied to Glasgow as well. I didn't uh, end up applying to Exeter. I, I don't know if I even wrote the application. I think I wrote up the application, but then there might have been a fee and I didn't want to pay the fee. I <laughs> <laughs> That is completely understandable. There's a lot of like that in my, uh, <laughs> how I got to where I am. <laughs> well, that one has a fee. And it's like, if I go to the UK, I don't have to take the GRE. <laughs> Decision made. <laughs> yeah, which is both expensive and a terrible test that I will do horribly on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it meant that I got to study abroad for... A long period Yay. of time, which was... It's also a very exciting thing to get to do, I suppose, isn't it? It's got to have a huge draw going somewhere else and exploring somewhere else. Do you think that the interest in castles was woven into that? That, like, you got... To, there's that exciting idea of going somewhere else to study a type of building that doesn't really exist mm. where oh, you're yeah. based? Definitely. Um, my family had gone over to Scotland a couple of times by that point, and we had always stopped it. Um, castles and abbeys and stuff and they were they were fascinating I just didn't realize that was something you could like I don't know pursue academically properly mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so I knew that like well if I'm gonna study these things you kind of have to be able to see them mm -hmm. it's really hard <laughs> to see them from North America um, yeah. yeah definitely <laughs> Yeah, Google can only do so much. And well, especially then, it wasn't nearly as uh, as useful as it is now. <laughs> that was prolific. So yeah, and I did some sort of like cost analysis as well, and like, well, this is how much it's going to cost me to do a PhD in the United States, and this is how much it's going to cost for me to do in the UK, and it worked out about the same. Except that if I were to do it in the US or in Canada, I would have to still make trips to Europe <laughs> to see yeah, of course yeah the actual you know buildings or the archives and stuff and yeah. like, well I might as well just do it over there so that I don't have to have that extra research expense <laughs> yeah you don't you don't need to get you don't need to make yourself extra ones of those absolutely not <laughs> no exactly definitely not <laughs> So how did that kind of translate itself into how did you bridge that gap between knowing that you'd had this kind of inspiring moment with um, Richard and, and Castles? How did that translate itself into an idea for what you would like to take forward into future study? Well, I didn't have much of an idea of what I wanted to do when I when I arrived in Scotland as a, a wide eyed um, <laughs> master <laughs> student. Um, <laughs> Basically, I was like, I want to do castles. And I had a vague idea that I was somehow still going to fit Vikings into this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Richard was like, eh, probably not. Um, <laughs> and he basically just sat me down with this list of books <laughs> and was like, read all of this, um, which essentially was all the reading material that he had on his uh, Castles course that he ran as an undergraduate model at Sterling. And I had, I don't know, a month to catch up. <laughs> Anyway, it was probably longer. I don't know how long it was. But anyway, he, I had a whole bunch of books to read and kind of like sift through. And like, he just kept asking me like, okay, well, what's interesting you and like comparing it to what's already been done in Scotland, as far as castles go and stuff. And one of the big things that grabbed my attention, well, there were two things that grabbed my attention. Um, one was this type of study called access analysis. Mm -hmm. And it's basically looking at the internal structures and where the rooms are located and how you access one point from another point. Yeah. Um, and kind of what okay. that tells you about how people lived in that structure. Yeah. Yeah. So like, which places are like really highly controlled and like, Okay, mm -hmm. you can only access this one room from this one way or like 
a string of rooms that you have to walk through to get to this final chamber. Yeah. Versus like a hall that has like, you know, 50 different entrances. Well, maybe not 50, but three, four <laughs> different entrances. Hole. This is this is Scotland we're talking about. We don't have <laughs> 50 different entrances. Um, and I was just fascinated about that and like the discussions on like, oh, how this, what this says about how the nobility were sharing space with like um, the serving classes and, and all of yeah. that. I was super intrigued by that, which hadn't really been done. It'd been done a little bit in Scotland, but not um, to a degree that it hadn't been exhausted anyway. Mm -hmm. And the other new sort of fangled thing <laughs> was making sure that when you're looking at um, the structure of the castle to incorporate the landscape around it when you're assessing uh, the structure and what it um, is doing, like what the, the Lord is doing as far as demonstrating his authority or how he's making use of the resources and all of yeah. that, making sure that you're incorporating the fact that like, hey, there are gardens, there are, you know, hunting forests, there is a river and, you know, there are mills and fishing rights and all of this other stuff. I seem to remember you getting quite obsessed about beehives at one point as well and where all the wax came from. Yes, yeah, I I did have a uh a mild detour. It wasn't very mild. <laughs> it, I spent far too much time on this. <laughs> um yeah, I got a little sidetracked by I don't even know where the reference is now. I need to dig it up cuz I want to pick this this little trail back up again. I think it's very important that you go back to it. <laughs> uh, there's some like Lord donated a ridiculous amount, like 500 pounds worth of wax to an abbey, beeswax to an abbey. And I was like, I just was like, that's a lot of... First, I verified that it was pounds weight and not pounds mm -hmm. money. Yeah. And then once I confirmed that it was pounds weight, it's like, that's a lot of wax. <laughs> it's like, how many bees does it take <laughs> to make that much wax? And then like, <laughs> it spiraled from there and being like, okay, well, obviously all these lands and like noble landscapes had to have beehives in there as well like a lot of them mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i got really into the whole landscape part of it <laughs> <laughs> do you think that was partly inspired by um the directions that Ri richard is interested in looking in do you think the the conversations that you had and the visits that you went on because i know that he took you to visit a lot of these places do you think that was one of the things that inspired that looking at the landscape. Oh yeah. Yeah, he's very interested in in the landscape as well and yeah, as he was just talking about it and all the 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 things that we don't know <laughs> about the landscape. Yeah. It was just kind of like, oh, um this is obviously a place where research is needed, so it would be foolish not to try to fill this gap. I just wondered if you no know, one you'd said towards the start um of our our discussion about how you love this idea of kind of living history um mm. and do, do you think that that played a part into this you know this desire that you had to learn more about the use of space and things like that because it gives you that connection to how people were actually using these spaces yeah. it's more just that they're not just sites they're, they're places that people were actually engaging with yeah exactly they were you know they physically lived there like this is a room that somebody slept in on a regular basis and these you know how did you how did you get from this place to the other like I don't know you think about your daily life and well I spend a currently a lot of time in my own home um, so I don't find it quite as interesting <laughs> to think about it <laughs> but it's just yeah it's that connection to the daily life and like okay well this is how I get from one point to the other and if I decide mm -hmm. that I want to go for a walk and I'm you know in my office slash bedroom you know I would go down the stairs and you know this is go to the place where all the shoes and the coats are kept and you know just how you maneuver physically maneuver within the structure and then you know wander outside and like that mm -hmm. To me, that's like such a almost in like an intimate connection to other people, like knowing how that 
maneuvering happens and knowing how that happened in the past um, yep. was just something that I was super and still super interested in knowing and excited by and I find it so fascinating mm. yeah how, how did you go about ch- selecting case studies for your um, master's and your PhD once you knew that you know once you'd got like the the things that you wanted to look at how did you go about selecting the, the places that it was going to be that you researched um Yeah, so we selected for my master's with the help of Richard, of course, um, who was very wise in encouraging me to uh, look at structures that had structural remains um, for my master's. (laughs) So (laughs) I ended up studying the well, three castles um, that belonged to the Douglases um, for my master's. So I looked at Threve and Bothwell and Tintalan, and they're three beautiful sites um, that still have a large chunk of their structure remaining. <laughs> yeah, always helpful. <laughs> Which is always helpful. <laughs> and yeah, we wanted to look at just a, a noble family that had quite a high standing uh, and what, what kind of the structures were saying about uh, not only the Douglases' power, um, but how they had to be incredibly organized in order to execute the jobs that they were given um, (laughs) by the (laughs) crown. And so, you know, that organization and the ability to, to control whether it was money or men, um, how was that reflected in the structures that they created and the landscapes around them? That sort of thing um, was what I was hoping to sort of look at for my master's um, and and did a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with, yes, there's structural remains. Um, the structural remains tend to be a lot later <laughs> than the time period mm-hmm. that I wanted to study. That, yeah, that you were wanting to look at, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I'm, I'm being a little bit more hesitant on what like my actual findings were because it's like well but the structure most of the structure that we have now is you know 16th century maybe some 17th century <laughs> um yeah so. but it gave I, I presume then gave you some really helpful skills in recognizing what was you know when things were built and how different it might look if it was built in the 16th or the 17th century instead of the 15th or the 14th century. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, lots of of different types of construction styles and, and stuff. Um, and then I ended up doing quite a bit of archival uh, research as well, mm-hmm. trying to trace back the various different stages uh, that these sites had and Um, yeah counting the number of people that might have been staying at them that sort of thing um, Mm -hmm. which is what I did for my master's so that was that was really useful but yeah I got really focused on the landscape side um, and the masters and then decided that I really wanted to focus on the landscapes and I wanted there to be a decent variety of geography when I studied did a study for my PhD. So I wanted there to be some ocean side coastal castles, um, as well as some more towards the hills and stuff in between. So we settled on looking at Angus, which is kind of where Dundee is and North and West. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and looking at the castles just in Angus and what, kind of landscape features they had um so i did a big survey which you know you think oh it's only one one little county one shire there's not (laughs) gonna be many castles (laughs) or like it'll be a manageable number right like 20 (laughs) castles or something (laughs) no no there's a lot of castles or at least references to a lot of castles in angus like there's over a hundred and not all of them survive like very few of them survive Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. which became the frustrating element of (laughs) it all is that yeah there's like (laughs) technically over a hundred you know noble residences listed in angus but not very many of them survive and the ones that do survive have a bunch of much later architecture in them and all of that um so again 
I ended up being a little bit more archive document focused than actual structural <laughs> focused in my research. Which again, there's not a whole lot surviving there either, but there's... Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was one of the things I was going to ask actually about. I know that in comparative studies, you'd been seeing how inventories and things like that had been used to think about, you know, the numbers of people in a room, the numbers of bits of furniture in a room and that sort of thing. And I know that you did struggle yeah. trying to find that sort of evidence for Scotland in the period that you were looking at. So I wondered what then was like, became the main source of information when that thing you'd been hoping to find <laughs> wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So most of the surviving like inventories are 16th century or later, so not really medieval. Um <laughs> <laughs> and yeah there wasn't a whole lot of wasn't a whole lot of documentary evidence either what i ended up using mostly were charters of when people were granting the land um to someone else so whether it was the crown that was granting um the land uh -huh. um or it was being officially granted to an heir or um something like that and Mm -hmm. In those charters, they would list um, a bunch of the features uh, that were a yeah. part of the land. Um, so they would often list that there was a castle there or a, f a whole string of synonyms for castle, <laughs> um, which <laughs> may, or, may or may not have actually meant that there was a castle there. Was it just a tower? Was it a fortalice? Is there a difference <laughs> between a fortalice and a castle? Um <laughs> Does a fortalis just pertain to like a fortified outside wall? Um, we could uh, <laughs> have an episode just on the various Latin the terms. The semantics of castles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it was like a whole, all of them, all of the terms. <laughs> it's like there was a castle, a tower, and a fortalis, and a manor. Um, and <laughs> And then sometimes it was just a castle. Sometimes it was just a tower. It was inconsistent. Um, yep. Yeah. And as much as I wanted there to be some sort of rhyme or reason as to like, oh, well, it says tower in, you know, 1398, but then it's a uh, castle in 1485. That means it's developed into a, a bigger, no, uh, there's uh -uh. 1513, it's back to tower. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> they also listed, aside from um, the structural terms, they listed sometimes um landscape features <laughs> um so mm. sometimes they would talk about how this property included um gardens or orchards or uh, parks or what was most common were fishings and uh -huh. mills so what ended up kind of surfacing um, from all of this desperate research to find something useful mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> was that a lot of uh most of the time these these castles when they were um being issued particularly if it was um being granted as a barony um they were being granted not only the right to a fortified structure i will <laughs> use my my terms as broadly as possible <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the right to a fortified structure, the right to fishings, and the right to millings. Now, whether or not these actually were physically part of the, the, the landscape at the time, or if they were then like, oh, great, I have the right to build a castle, I'm going to build one now, is not conclusive. Um, and depends on the site, yeah. depends on a whole bunch of other things um, that we can't always pinpoint. At the very least, very two important landscape features associated with castles are fishings and mills. And I suppose it's to do with production and what they can, obviously having the castle is all well and good, but if it's a big enough castle, it's going to have plenty of people to feed and that sort of thing in it. So it's got to come with other <laughs> features um, for the people to survive and yeah provide for the other people within their yeah. castle space i suppose mm -hmm. exactly um and so yeah being able to provide plenty of salmon is you know an essential part of showing authority um and then there's um 
a bit of a community aspect to the mills, um, like for the right to the mills, like you would have to have, or you would, wouldn't have to have, you would require um, the people <laughs> living on your land to use your mill. Uh-huh. And not only does that ensure that you get some of everybody's grain, but it kind of also makes sure that everybody comes in to the mill to your property to check in you know every now mm-hmm. and then like whenever they are well yearly yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, maybe twice a year depending on how well the crops are doing <laughs> um yeah but but yeah it, it requires people to come in to your close to your like the central point of the property and that's you know where you get to interact with them um yeah so whether that's you know dispensing justice or hearing out um other pleas or just telling them news or you know that sort of thing it mm-hmm. becomes this uh part of the noble landscape that is um a a place a feature that it's not just nobles interacting with it's a lot of the the everyday folk living um all of your tenants living on your your property that are interacting with this feature, which is both designed as a, well, that can be used as a a display of power and a function of everyday life. Food. Mm -hmm. Food. (laughs) So yeah, I tried uh, to sort of locate where the mills were to see how close they were to the, the noble residents and you know, what that kind of said as far as the nobility keeping their noble residents in a, a, or what the location of the noble residence to the mill sort of suggested and, you know, how they were interacting mm-hmm. with the lower classes, I guess, the rest of the people living on their land, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, which was difficult to do because mills don't really provide a whole bunch of surviving archaeological evidence. <laughs> I know that you used a lot of maps, though, Kate, didn't you? Yeah. I, I think I can probably guess, but which maps did you find most useful? Um I think people would like to hear about them. Yes. Uh, Timothy Pont did a great survey um, of Scotland. He did survey sort of late 16th century, early 17th century. Um, So it's Mm -hmm. it's a bit later than the time period I was studying, but it was pretty much the, the closest thing I could come to. And he... Yeah, drew these maps and had like little figures of the castles and had um, markings of where the mills were, um, did often like a X with a circle in it to indicate that there was a mill there. Um, so I was able to pinpoint the likely location of these mills through that. These are all freely available for you to peruse through the National Library of Scotland. If you guys are interested, then you should check out the maps of Timothy Pont. Um, there are older maps in there as well, but not necessarily as detailed. Mm-hmm. So I was wondering, um, knowing what you do about um, the kind of the use of space and, and the landscape, even just how many <laughs> sites there were um, at one point, regardless of how many are left now, do you think that there's enough information out there for people who are just accessing these sites cold you know how you you get these heritage organizations and they're always trying to kind of overhaul the interpretation and Mm. rethink the way that sites were used and and things like that but do you think that there's space there to maybe incorporate more work like your work into that to give more of an understanding to the public um possibly um i think uh, there needs to be a little bit more work on the research end and perhaps tag teamed with some archaeological research a bit more (laughs) before that could be or should be incorporated a bit Mm -hmm. but the scope is there i think there are a couple of sites that might be good candidates for that you know based on what i have done a lot more research needs to be done (laughs) (laughs) it's such a tricky area (laughs) you were incredibly brave to undertake uh, a subject like that. Oh. I don't know how you did it. <laughs> um, I don't know if brave's the right term. Foolish might have been. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was um, potentially uh, being incredibly stubborn in that I really wanted to find the answers to something when there weren't documents and there weren't structural or archaeological remains <laughs> enough to give me the answers that I wanted. <laughs> yep. <laughs> 
underpins most of studies out there, I think. That's stubbornness. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yes, I think I should probably approach things from a different angle <laughs> in the future. Um, <laughs> but now, I know that now. <laughs> That's it, exactly. It was an experience in itself to learn what you want to do when you take it forward. That's <laughs> Yeah, plus Richard for putting up with me. But I, I think I've learned my lesson, so that's that's the, the, the good thing, right? <laughs> Knowing what you do know, how would you take this forward? Or do you have plans to take it forward? Is this something that you want to return to and, and kind of explore further? I have enjoyed my respite from this particular topic. <laughs> over the last several years. Um, but I I do think that there's a lot of scope there to do more of a like a overall catalog of what um sort of landscape features were being talked about in the charters. Like what I want to do is expand that beyond Angus itself and sort of mm -hmm. how that looked across Scotland. And that I think would be really interesting and incredibly useful in identifying like where there might be scope to do more of an archaeological dig to to try to find some of these mm -hmm. um these features so i do kind of sort of have dreams plans i'm gonna call them dreams more than plans at this point <laughs> um that's gonna take a lot of time <laughs> to to catalog all of these and I don't have a lot of time right now for that scope of um, research, but I can still dream about it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you then have, uh, this is just going, just thinking about the, the places that have inspired you most. Do you have a favorite castle that you like it's like the epitome of what you'd like them all to be <laughs> oh. uh, in terms of records or surviving buildings or things like that uh well i have lots of favorites i don't think any of them fall into the light of what i want them to be the ones that i <laughs> are what i want them to be aren't in scotland <laughs> Like they're either in England or France, where they have surviving like records and um, yes. <laughs> structure. <laughs> but I think, as far as from Angus, Edsel, Edsel is yeah. an awesome site um, with a lot of cool surviving structure, and there's a good tower and some bits of the hall left, and there's a great garden, really gorgeous, and you can see the Mott from the original Mott and Bailey castle that was on the site from the the main castle that's standing now. So like you can see it from the hall. Um, and, and I think that's really cool because it's um, kind of like incorporating this is, you know, we, we might have this nice luxurious place now, but like we've been here. And this has uh, been a seat of power for a long time. See, see that over there shows that. Like a vision of the legacy almost in the landscape. Yeah, yeah. That's a great place to visit. Um, I would definitely recommend going there. A lot of my other favorites ones are like not places you can actually visit or they don't survive anymore. Oh. <laughs> I was wondering then, Kate, if there's any other projects that you're looking forward to doing or that you've been like that you've had on the sidelines of of the main study that you that you've been wanting to take forward. Um, the only one that I'm semi serious about is the one about the bees and beekeeping in Scotland. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been sort of interested in that, but that's all very slow and in the background. <laughs> I don't have any major Well, you're plans. a very busy person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With a very small person who's very much reliant on your, you know, <laughs> your time at the moment. I think that's only fair. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, thank you both for asking me questions this time. <laughs> thank you for inviting us to yes, ask you questions. thank you. It was amazing to speak to you. <laughs> it's great to listen uh, to how you got into to exploring Scottish castles. Um not necessarily the path you were going for, not those no. Vikings. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's okay. I'm I'm okay with that now. I still like the Vikings, but I'm glad yeah. I was converted over to castles. <laughs> yeah, the castles need the spotlight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. The Scotta Chronicast is just one of many things relating to medieval history on medievalists.net. 
If you like what you see and what you hear, consider being a patron on patreon.com slash medievalists. Thank you for joining us on the Scotta Chronicast. Please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow our account on Twitter, at Scotta Chronicast. Our music is Ex to Lux Oratur by Gaeta. Thanks for listening. 